Colleagues, we will start with opening remarks. Then we will have a first round table on challenges of staying at home. That is going to be facilitated by Adriana Allen, the president of the Habitat International Coalition. We will have a second round table facilitated by Lorena Zarate on how can local and regional governments facilitate these stay at home policies. And then we will have a wrap up session facilitated by our secretary general. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing will be in the, well, is in this call in this session, uh, and she will be setting the scheme. I will just go through to our speakers in order for you to know who is in the room. We will, ha we will have the Habitat Secretary of Bogota, the Mayor of Grini, the Vice Mayor of Cocody, the Mayor of Bucabu, the Mayor of San Nagrigu, the Vice Mayor of Barcelona, the Secretary of Urbanism of Montevideo, the Councillor of a councillor of Montreal, the Secretary of Urban Agenda of Catalonia, the Human Rights Commissioner of the City of Vienna, the Vice Minister of Housing of Costa Rica, the Chief Physician and the Chief of the Disease Control and Prevention of the City of Guangzhou, the Director of Housing of the City of Xi'an in China, the Head of Planning of Iztapalapa, and many other partners related to housing, to urban development, and to many other matters. Having said this, I will now yield the floor to our Secretary General to facilitate the welcome and opening remarks. Emilia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, let me know if you lose me because this is a difficult day for Wi-Fi here in Barcelona. But uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this second uh, live learning experience um, that, that we are organizing in order to facilitate the changes from our diverse uh, membership around this uh, pandemic that has hit us all um, quite by surprise, right? Uh, none of us knew that our 2020 would be like this. And um, the critical issue that we're going to be dealing with today, we had the first session where we just exchange general experiences, hopes, concerns. Today we are focusing on one very important matter because our collective uh, knowledge in the world from the World Health Organization and from health authorities has shown us that confinement is one of the critical measures that the whole world needs to undertake to beat this pandemic. Now, confinement is easier said than done because you need the home for that. In the places where the majority of the population does have a home, it's difficult to comply with the confinement. It's difficult for people to understand why they shouldn't be leaving home. And Local governments are making very important efforts to ensure that everything around them works so that they can stay at home safely. You have a very big part of the world, however, where a stay at home is not even a possibility because you have very high percentages of the population that do not have a home. They do not have a roof above their head. And when they do have a roof above their heads, it's a roof where too many people are living, where confinement is not safe, where they might not have the right service for it. And still, it is the only thing we know that works for the pandemic. So this session today um, is actually a discussion about a topic um, that is very critical for the pandemic. But we also want to give it the perspective of the realities, what we are discovering in our day-to-day um, in, in, in day -day on housing, the access to housing and the right to housing, is that we have had important gaps in this access to housing that were very well known to us all before the pandemic and many of us were working on that and we have some of the key players around this virtual table that can uh, share with us what we knew structurally what we can do now for the pandemic and what it might need to change 
in this field. So this is pretty much the background. Look, it is a complex conversation because we are 224 people in this table. So you might think it's just the smallest screen you have in front of you, but we are many, 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 right? So we're going to try to be as organized as possible. We're going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, and please, as honest as possible. What we are doing here is create collective learning. What we are doing here is to exchange reality, not to showcase all the great things that we do, which I know you do, and I want them, <laughs> I want you to share it, but I think we need to be very frank, address the concerns, and also um, identify those issues that we will need to work on in the future. So two objectives. Let us share what works. Let us give each other ideas about the policies that we, can, um, that we can put in place. But also, let us think about the future a little bit. So I'm going to start uh, inviting um, the Executive Director and, and Assistant Secretary General to the UN, uh, Maimouna Sharif, to, to address uh, this meeting and share with us the long-standing work that UN Habitat has been doing on housing and the perspective of the UN community. Well, it's, it's a privilege for me to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Maimuna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Emilia. Uh, a very good afternoon from Nairobi, good morning, good, good evening, uh, colleagues, city leaders, friends, partners, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon and on the topic of uh, housing first. Uh, we must think, act and collaborate beyond the outbreak. Together, together with cities and local governments, COVID-19 is already shaking our belief that we can save life as we thought we could. It also shakes our belief that we can continue to plan and manage cities as we thought we should or we can. But at the very least, we all are now convinced that adequate housing is, the, is of utmost importance. All people need adequate housing to stay at home. We are asked, we have been asked to stay at home. But how about the homeless and, and, and the people who don't have a home? So what is the stay at home meant for them? So I was reassured that the first session with cities from Guangzhou to Rome and from Durban to Buenos Aires, that local and regional governments have been able so far to continue public services while preparing and responding in the health emergency and in providing social services. Governors and mayors in urban areas are playing leading roles in slowing the pandemic spreading while keeping their cities functioning. The international response should therefore be decentralized and tailored to the relevant context by working closely with local governments. I am moreover convinced that the first thematic session of our joint initiative UCLG and Metropolis must be about housing, the right to adequate housing as a component of the right to an adequate standard of living is a universally recognized human right. Now, it is also central in our battle against COVID-19 Without adequate housing, social distancing and hygiene are simply impossible. Adequate housing is now a matter of life and death at this moment and in the future. The economic impact of COVID-19 is creating instability in incomes, particularly for small business businesses, low income and informal workers and self-employed contractors who are facing closure, job losses, and economic hardship which could result in rental and mortgage areas and the threat of forced eviction. People who are living in inadequate housing are likely to have poor health 
due to the absence of basic services and adequate shelter. At the extreme end of the scale, people who are homeless are even more vulnerable. Stay at home policy also increases the safety challenges of domestic violence and gender-based violence. There are worse if neighborhoods are already overcrowded or with the problematic safety and security context of women of girls. Mental and physical health also for children is more easily compromised in the neighborhood, lacking access to nearby public spaces and green areas. The pandemic affects us all, yet it is hitting the world's worst vulnerable people, the hardest, especially those living in informal settlement and slums, in crowded, unhealthy, and inadequate living condition. COVID-19 exposes more than 1 billion people living in slum and in, in, in adequate housing. Regular hand washing and social distancing are among the key measures currently put in place in an attempt to prevent the transmission of highly infectious COVID-19 disease. But however, people living in the informal settlement and slum do not have the opportunity to self-protect as water for basic services and needs in short supply. Housing is, is inadequate, space is constrained, and access is compromised. The problem is human settlement issue as housing, land, and property cuts across both urban and rural setting. Growing insecurity in urban areas may result in movement of people to, to their rural bases to access to welfare and services. The movement of people will leave houses locked and overcrowded or occupied by others, migrant refugee in setting while vacant or not. Tenure insecurity and conflict always arise out of forced displacement of COVID-19 may become a tremendous catalyst for civil unrest. It is crucial for government to follow lead of the current innovators and champions put in place mechanism to protect those most vulnerable to the current emergency. For this reason, in short term, UN Habitat encourages local government at a minimum adopt the following emergency measures. One, provide temporary and emergency accommodation to all people without secure housing to enable them to practice social distancing and necessary health-related measures by leveraging the use of underutilized spaces and repurposing, repurposing the off buildings of an increased supply of shelter and other appropriate measures. Second, put in place emergency safe drinking water and hand washing facilities in key locations in informal settlement and slum by providing water tanks, stand pipes, hand washing facilities, and sanitizers, along with hygiene messages and social distancing instruction. Third, take extraordinary measures to secure the right to housing of all. This is will be medium term and the long term in Italy through moratorium of eviction due to the rental and mortgage areas, deferral of mortgage payment, extension of winter moratorium on forced eviction of informal settlement and slum, introduction of rental stabilization or reduction measures and suspension of utility costs and surcharges for durations of pandemic. And fourth, explore option for vulnerable communities or neighborhood to assess repurpose building land and open space for essential small businesses food security emergency health care and other vital function needed while people stay at home so the covid 19 is a unique global opportunity to demonstrate that it is possible to provide housing and land tenure security to all through increasing preparedness in urban areas to respond extreme event to promoting overall sustainable of housing sector. And UN Habitat are working together with our partners in Nairobi, in other parts of the global, in uh, putting up the challenges of this COVID-19. Colleague, I will be with you for 45 minutes. After that, I have to attend my senior manage management meeting with the Secretary General, also talking about COVID-19 uh, this, after this. Thank you very much, Amelia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Executive Director. Thank you for these words. I think that you have summarized it very well. And, uh, and just for the ease of, of, of this large audience that we have, 
I think that we need to group uh, uh, this debate and, and we have chosen to do it by, by showing uh, the realities of uh, not such a large municipalities with also municipalities where, where there is an important issue around informality and, and, and people uh, without a home. Uh, and then we need to talk about what we can do in policy development to support those cases where people might have a home, but they will need to face huge difficulties to keep that home or to make that home uh, adequate for this. I mean, it is, no, um, it, 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 is, it is no mystery to anybody that, for instance, the issues of, of gender violence are, are increasing in, in, in many, many households in the world, yeah? because staying at home has a lot of implications and, and tension. So these are some of the things that we are hoping will come up also in the, in the second part of our discussion, in the second panel. First panel, the difficulty of attending those most vulnerable without a home or not adequate homes, and then second, uh, policy development. Just a comment also on, I think that this needs to make us think of this point of not, no return, but we also need to be very realistic about what local governments can do alone and what local governments are facing on their own without national support. I'm not sure whether we have our, our Brazilian friends with us, but um, we have been very actively communicating with them and they have shared how lonely they feel in, in some cases because there is no organized federal support, no acknowledgement about what needs to be addressed. So, there are different aspects to this discussion that I hope we can take into account. I don't see my colleague uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, whom I was hoping to give the floor to talk on behalf of Africa. He might join later. Let us go to Leilani. Uh, Leilani, we've got a special relation with you as rapporteur. We have participating in, participated in making the shift, eh? changing the perception of what needed to be done about uh, housing a very big campaign for cities around the world and yet this crisis is making us go further and look at things differently opportunities and risks the floor is yours Leilani five minutes thank you so much Amelia uh, thank you to UCLG to UN Habitat and Metropolis for hosting the session I I think it's incredibly important session. I think the fact that there are 238 participants on the on this call is suggestive of how pressing this matter really is. Um, you know, both of you have already so well explained what's happening, the challenges, and also some of the opportunities. I'll just make a few highlights. I mean, as Amelia said, I've been working for the last many years, <laughs> trying to encourage governments to make a shift, a shift away from viewing housing as a commodity or as an, just an asset, and a shift toward understanding what it means to treat housing as a human right, as a home, as a, as a, a social good. Uh, what's so interesting and, and terrifying right now is that we now know what happens when the right to housing isn't implemented. We know in this circumstance that it, it puts the entire world at risk of contracting a deadly disease. There it is. That's what happens when you don't treat housing as a human right. And that's pretty sobering, um, pretty sobering. Um, it's clear that Globally, there is a stay at home policy as a way to flatten the pandemic curve and to decrease the rate of infections. And along with that, as uh, Memuna already described, comes hand washing, social distancing, or physical distancing, I should say. And we know that, at least in my schematic, there are really two big groups of people or populations. Um, where this is hugely problematic and a one-size-fits-all approach to health policy doesn't actually work. I've grouped them just conceptually for myself, for my own work, for practicality. 
people living in homelessness and informal settlements that are grossly inadequate, informal settlements where there's lacking water and sanitation in particular. I have that as one big group conceptually. And then the other group that I really want to focus on are those living in what I call housing precarity, where they are living paycheck to paycheck or uh, month to month, barely able to stay in their homes at the best of times, let alone when faced with a, a worldwide economic recession or depression. So these are people whose homes are at risk. And uh, I've come up with a series of recommendations. I'm, I'm developing what I'm calling guidance notes and I'm trying to generate them day by day. So I, I had one yesterday, thank you, Amelia. I had one yesterday on informal settlements. Today I'm releasing one on, home, on homelessness. Um, and then I'll go from there. Um, but I've been very clear, there should be no evictions of anyone, anywhere, for any reason. And we can call that consistent with human rights, which it is, but we can also call that a logical extension of a stay-at-home policy. That we don't have to even bring in human rights if that becomes too complicated. No evictions of anyone, anywhere, for any reason. With respect to people living in homelessness, they must be housed period. They must be housed. And that doesn't mean in overcrowded shelters. It means in those places where this is possible. It means hotel rooms, motel rooms, um, uh, converting big warehouses into individualized units. This can be done very, very quickly. We know this from the humanitarian world. It can be done and it must be done because that's what physical distancing and stay at home requires. With respect to informal settlements, I think that um, Maimuna already described what needs to happen there. Access to water and sanitation, disinfectants, soap, a, a, a constant flow of clean water, toilets, showers, you know, proper sanitation, this is all obvious um, and, and ob ob obviously consistent with the right to housing. With respect to people who are struggling to pay the rent or pay their mortgage, there have to be relief programs. And these relief programs, which I'm seeing emerge in countries around the world, have to take into consideration that it's just simply not good enough to allow people to incur debt over time. So that at the end of the pandemic, you wake up, you look around, and you are completely flattened and your household is flattened with debt. That's not going to work. People need loan and mortgage forgiveness, rent forgiveness. That's the only way that people will come out of this pandemic, emerge healthy and healthy households, uh, not just physically healthy, but also economically a little more healthy. Um, I want to just touch on, and then I'm going to close, um, this issue of local governments needing national support. I cannot, I, I feel, I always feel very allied with cities and local governments and, region, and, and regional governments, to be honest. And I am very concerned with what's happening between local and national levels. I live in a federal state. Uh, and in my country, the federal government has been very strong, very active, um, throwing a lot of money at this issue, uh, in doing really amazing things. And yet still in these circumstances, local governments, municipalities are struggling. And part of that is there, there needs to be national leadership, but that national leadership has to support local governments to follow along. And that means money, information, resources, bodies on the ground helping. Uh, and I'm not seeing enough synergy between national level and local level. If I can do anything in that regard, maybe I need to issue a guidance in that regard. So I'm just going to keep my ears open, listen to you and learn from you. And thank you so much for including me in this important discussion. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Leilani. Um, let, me, let me do a suggestion on behalf of this large group that we have, and I am sure that local and regional governments are going to, uh, to reflect that in their, in their presentations as, as we start with that. Um, I just think that national and federal governments do not understand the importance of the service provision around the health service provision. They do not understand the importance of local service provision in general uh, without those and without 
the, the service providers without the staff of the local governments, there would be no service provision in those places where the infrastructure is there. And, um, and I don't think that the right value is given to that, let alone to the political leadership of this sphere of government. Even in places where the coordination is not that bad, I just don't think that this is in the right place of the discussion. And I think producing some guidance around this would be very, very critical. So allow me now to, um, to, to give the floor to my colleagues from the World Secretariat, uh, uh, Juan Carlos. He is going to start um, with an important consultation for, for us. You have all been asked to uh, use your Mentimeter, this application that you can uh, use in your phone. This consultation is important with, uh, for us because it's helping us define how we are going to shape the future learning experiences and what our guidance notes are going to be focusing on, uh, etc. So uh, please do participate. We take this very seriously. It will not be very long. It will take a couple of minutes. Uh, Juan Carlos, are you ready? And Amanda? Yes, we are. So the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, at the top of the screen, you will see the number if you haven't logged in uh, to menti.com. So use that code uh, and you will see the questions as we are showing them in the screen. So first, uh, just an open question. What issues do we need to consider uh, to ensure everyone can safely stay at home? What issues come to mind when you think of, of this? So we can see rights, house, vulnerable communities, homeless, Friends. I think our hearts are in the right place, right? We are talking <laughs> about everything that we have been talking in the introduction. This is a good news. But I also like Amanda and Juan Carlos, what is coming out in terms of also other service provision, uh, food security, water, sanitation, dom uh, this, domestic. the domestic violence yeah. issue is, is, is coming. Yeah, so I think very, very relevant inputs and, and I think the construction of this session is in the, in the, in the right place. Shall we go to the second question? Yes, uh, let's go. So this one's uh, in a scale from one to 10, how important do you think the following housing measures are? You're gonna see them in, this, in your screen. This is about the importance of this measure at this moment. Uh, I'm gonna read them so that the interpreters can help me in case it is necessary secure adequate emergency housing for isolation, continued social service provision, uh, safe and adequate shelter for homeless, uh, implement a moratorium on evictions, and the fifth last one, uh, measures regarding rent and mortgages. So I we are, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So we are saying that uh, the moratorium of evic on eviction is uh, for now the most important one, the most shared one. Uh, followed by uh, the the way to provide safe and adequate shelter for homeless population, but I mean all of uh, these priorities are very shared by uh, the voters for now. Uh, yeah. You can see there is almost an equal yes, an equal it, priority here. Yeah. The, all of these are have been mentioned and are very important. But now looking at the next question, how easy it is for a local or regional government to implement these measures by their own? And I think this is a very important question for this uh, community that is gathering here. We have the same five options for those who uh, are using interpretation. So we're and 10 seeing, is very yeah. difficult and one is very easy. Hmm. I like to see that that our um, that the overwhelming majority of the participants are, of course, local government practitioners or local government officers, and I like to see the level of responsibility that hmm. these uh, that these answers uh, provide, because they could have easily all said, "Look, um, it's extremely difficult. We cannot do it." 
um, but I I think that that putting this the the, the, the in the middle of of the chart really shows a, a, a level of responsibility and compromise with these measures that is that is very is very interesting and and I like to see with the amount of global south that we have in the call I really like also to see the moratorium on evictions being high up because it's, it's really not an easy, an easy thing. I don't know, Amanda, if you have other comments on this one. Yeah, we can see that uh, it's, it's raising on the difficult part now. It's getting... <laughs> 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 uh, but, but yes, I mean, uh, we, we can... We can th the, the moratorium on evictions is still one of, uh, of the, the priority which seems the most important but the most difficult to implement at, from the local level. Yeah, our our World Organization has been quite vocal in in putting uh, um, stop evictions very high on, on on our agenda, particularly during this crisis. So I'm very happy to see that the membership does identify with that. Do we still have one more question? Yes, please? last question. I think I think uh, uh, Emilia, open. can I come in? Emilia, yes, please. Please. Yeah, I think uh, when you look at this implement uh, moratorium on eviction, that shows that there are so many people out there they don't have a uh, they don't have a, a, a owner occupied uh, type of housing. They still either is renting or, or living in uh, somebody's land or somebody's house. Or I think this is you see that is the highest six point four. So this mm -hmm. is also one one area that we have to look into. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. So, last question, colleagues. Yes. Any other concerns? And we're gonna look into this uh, later in the question. So I'm gonna leave it open so that you answer and put any concerns that you have here. And you're gonna continue looking at it and in your phone. But we're gonna move forward uh, with the next uh, the next round session, Emilia.